Hello there, my name is B, and you're listening to The Biologist of It, the podcast where we get to the gist of what it is that biologists do. And this is my second minisode, so every other week I interview a biologist about their work using pop cultural references, and in the weeks in between I host minisodes where we look posthumously at a biologist with a really interesting career. And last week I brought you the tree frogs and women's rights of Bertha Lutz, so make sure you go back and have a look at that one if you missed it. And this week I'm going to be introducing you to the father of the green revolution, the man who fed a billion people. And if this sounds like something that you might be interested in, be sure to subscribe or follow. I'm on YouTube and also on podcasting platforms, so however you enjoy your podcasts, there are options for you to follow so you never miss an episode. But enough with all of that, let's get on and meet Norman Ernest Borlaug. And I'm excited to introduce you to Norman today because I've had a couple of people request this one and reading about it, what an interesting career, really, really interesting. And Norman is a great example of taking your family history and what you learn along the way and implementing that into your passions later on in life. Norman Ernest Borlaug was born on the 25th of March in 1914, which some of you might recognise as the year that World War I broke out, and he was born in Cresco, Iowa in the US. Norman was born on his grandparents' farm to Henry Oliver and Clara Borlaug, and was the older brother to three sisters. Norman worked on his family's 106 acre family farm, family, family farm, (laughs) from the age of seven to 19. And his days were filled with fishing, hunting, growing crops, raising livestock. Uh, And in true farming community style, he attended a one classroom, one teacher primary school until the age of 14, at which point he then went to join Cresco High in Iowa, US. Following high school, Borlaug left his family to pursue higher education and his grandfather Nels was very encouraging of this decision and he said to him, you're wiser to fill your head now if you want to fill your belly later on. And um, I love that and I'm going to make sure that I use it at work every day. (laughs) I work hard at work and then go home and have a big snack. (laughs) Uh, Although initially failing to pass the admissions to get into the University of Minnesota in 1933, He was then accepted to join the university's general college before transitioning to the College of Agriculture's forestry program. And during his time at college, he regularly took breaks to work in order to supplement his income. And during these breaks, we can perhaps see the first signs of what he was then going to become really known for. So during one of the breaks, he worked for the Civilian Conservation Corps, working with the unemployed, and many of the people he saw were starving. And he recalled seeing how food changed them as people. And another job he took would also go on to change his life, but this time for more romantic reasons. While waiting tables at a coffee shop, Norman met Margaret Gibson, and she was also working at the shop. And I can just imagine them going to clear a table at the same time and accidentally brushing hands as they reach for a used cup. (laughs) And Norman and Margaret married in 1937 and went on to have three children. So throughout his undergraduate degree, Norman would attend brilliant lectures hosted by many wondrous people, but one really changed his career path, and that's Elvin Charles Stackman. And Elvin was a pioneering plant pathologist studying wheat diseases, and he gave a speech that Norman attended entitled these shifty little enemies that destroy our food crops. And as you can guess, it was about different diseases and their effects on crops. And at the end of Elvin's speech, Norman asked him if he should go on to research forest diseases and Elvin told him, no, you should research plant diseases instead. And I know what you might be thinking. Yes, trees are plants. But one of the distinctions that we make in plant science is that what we need to do for trees is often vastly different from what we need to do for plants such as crops. Um, It's just a verbiage thing that we have going on sometimes. I don't know why. So instead of looking at tree diseases, Elvin said, why don't you look at plant diseases? Um, And so Norman did just that. And 
after he got his Bachelor of Science, he enrolled on a master's course with Elvin and earned his Master's of Science in 1940. And then just two years later, he was awarded his PhD in plant pathology and genetics. And if I told, if any of you are PhD students listening to that, two years to complete your PhD is pretty quick. Um, so don't be discouraged. It took me three years. It's taken most people I know between three to five. Two years is short. <laughs> don't worry. With his PhD completed in 1942, Norman was employed as a microbiologist at DuPont in Wilmington, Delaware. He hoped to be leading research on agricultural agents such as fungicides and preservatives, but there was a substantial event that forced his career in a slightly different direction. On December 7th, 1941, the Imperial Japanese Navy performed a surprise military strike on the US in Pearl Harbor. I mean, it was just terrible. Uh, hopefully I don't need to tell you too much more about Pearl Harbor. There's lots of information online. <laughs> so following on from this, his lab was converted to conduct research for the armed forces. And he had some pretty impressive projects going on, considering he was trained as a plant pathologist, but this is one of the wonderful things about scientists is that you say, I need this and they will go out and they will figure it out. Uh, and so a list of some of the things that he needed to do was, for example, develop a glue that could withstand warm water in the South Pacific, which he did very quickly, improving camouflage, finding ways to disinfect canteens in a war zone, um, producing DDT in large quantities to control malaria, and so on and so forth. Uh, DDT, in case you don't know, is, um, I'm going to try and say this, I'm going to lean in very close to my screen, sorry to my YouTube viewers, it is dichlorodiphenyltrichloroethane, <laughs> an easy one, um, which is a chemical compound originally discovered in Austria in 1874, developed as an insecticide in Switzerland in 1939, uh, and then was used as an insecticide against malaria around the world um, and was really, really popular and is now used as an agricultural uh, pesticide and it's a little bit of a nightmare. Um, it has some environmental impacts that we won't be going into in this one, but maybe that's something for another episode. So here we come to the part of the story where his inspirational work really starts to build to a crescendo. And in 1944, Norman became one of four members of a wheat research team called the Cooperative Wheat Research Reproduction Program. And the venture was created by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Mexican Ministry of Agriculture with the goal of boosting wheat production in Mexico. Norman worked on the project for 16 years and bred a series of incredibly high yield disease resistant wheats. And these wheats we're going to change the world. But it wasn't all plain sailing. And for the first 10 years of the project, he was trying to make wheat resistant to wheat stem rust, which is one of the biggest um, fungi causing issues, disease in wheat. So during this time, his group made 6,000 crossings of wheat. And by this, what I mean is they bred together 6,000 combination of different wheat cultivars and if you've ever worked in plant science, some of you might, you'll know that combining 6,000 different combinations of wheat is a lot of time and energy. So he was really working hard and it wasn't very fruitful um, until eventually Norman realised that he could speed up the breeding process of wheat by taking advantage of the fact that Mexico has two growing seasons. So in the summer, he would grow wheat in the central highlands, which were where the bulk of his research was already being taken, was already taking place, um, but it had really poor soil and had a high instance of this wheat rust. So what he would do is following the growing season, he would take the seeds um, north, to a research station near Kiwidad Obregon in Sonora. I hope I pronounced that correctly, sorry if I didn't. And the difference in altitudes and temperatures meant that more crops could be grown each year. 
and this became what is now known as the double wheat season. So growing wheat in run one place, taking it somewhere else, and growing it in another place, and then you get twice the growing season. So that's great. Uh, and that increases the yield that you'll get each year. So with the yield increased, the next thing he wanted to do was to go back and improve the disease resistance. Um, and what he did was he used a process called back crossing. Um, so let me try to explain what back crossing means. And this is going to take me a minute. So with back crossing, you need to start off with creating a hybrid plant. So plants can become hybrids. You can take two varieties of a plant um, and breed them together and you get what's called a hybrid because it's not the same variety breeding with itself it's a variety growing with breeding with another variety creating a hybrid and then what you do is you take that hybrid and you get it to breed with one of the parental ver varieties that it came from um, and then you keep doing this and then eventually the resistant genes in the parent become really prominent within that hybrids population um, and the reason that you might want to do this is because if you just had the resistant genes in the pi in the parental population they're more susceptible to losing their resistance against a pathogen um, a disease than if you had hybrids with high instances of different parental varieties resistance in them so let me try to put this in a, in, a, in another way. Um, so if you had 10 computers and they all had the same password and you had a computer virus that learned passwords and got in and, and caused issues, if they all had the same password, a virus would very quickly be able to spread through the 10 computers. Now, say that you give a couple of the computers the same password and a couple of the other computers the same password. So two of each of the computers have the same password. Then what happens is when the virus goes through the population of computers, it's likely to guess one. And so only two of the computers in the population are lost. The other ones are still not susceptible to it because they've got a different password. So it's a bit like that. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that things have um, resistance to a virus. And so using this method, he had now high yielding, high disease resistant wheats. Is there anything left for him to do? Absolutely. When you've got plants that are high yielding and um, they're something like wheat, when the grain on the top of the stalks gets very heavy and wheat is traditionally very tall and skinny, the crops fall over and then they're susceptible to rotting, you can lose a lot of the yield that way. So this is another nightmare with, with wheat. But there are varieties of wheat that are much shorter with thicker stems, or sometimes they have many short, thick stems with more uh, grain heads on top. And these are less likely to collapse under the weight of all of the extra grain. So in 1953, he acquired a semi-dwarf variety of wheat, um, which had more stalks and so more heads of grain to hold the extra weight. Um, and he crossed these together and produced a wheat variety adapted to tropical and subtropical climates that was also disease resistant and had this high yield. By 1963, 95% of the wheat crops used in Mexico were the semi-dwarf varieties developed by Norman and the harvest was six times larger than that in 1944 when the program was first started. So in 20 years, Norman increased the crop output of Mexico by six times and then didn't stop there. Norman kept going. And here, the crescendo's building, we're about to drop the base on Norman's great work called the Green Revolution. In 1963, the Rockefeller Foundation and Mexican government sent Norman, along with Dr. Robert Glenn Anderson, to India to continue his work. He set up test plots in Delhi, Ludhiana, Gantnagar, Kanpur, Pune, and Indore. Uh, and I don't know if I've pronounced those correctly, and I hope I have. Sorry in advance. Or sorry, post-haste. But it wasn't easy. They had to get a lot of grain out of Mexico and into these areas. 
and they had to battle the war between India and Pakistan over the Kashmir region. They had to back battle the Mexico-United States border. They had to battle the Watts riots in Los Angeles. But Norman and Robert's teams began importing semi-dwarf seed varieties to Pakistan and India. The initial yields harvested in South Asia following this were higher than any that had ever been harvested in South Asia before. Pakistan's import of wheat seeds were planted on 1.5 million acres and produced enough wheat to seed the entire nation's wheat land the following year. That's a lot of wheat. <laughs> so much wheat, in fact, that school buildings were temporarily closed to be used for grain storage. And in five years, the Pakistan wheat yield doubled from 4.6 million tonnes to 7.3 million tonnes, and they became self-sufficient in wheat production by 1968. At this time, a biologist called Paul R. Ehrlich wrote in his 1968 bestseller, The Population Bomb, he wrote, quote unquote, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. All the while, while this was literally happening alongside Pakistan becoming self-sufficient, William Gould of the United States Agency for International Development was calling Borlaug's work a green revolution. So the jury is split. <laughs> Some people are saying this is the end of humanity. Some people recognizing that this is potentially not the end of humanity. <laughs> and so it's no surprise then that for his contributions to the world food supply, Norman was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. So while his wife collected a phone call in Mexico City at four in the morning to be told by the Norwegian officials that he had won the award, Norman was out in the test fields in the Toluca Valley, 40 miles away from Mexico City. So Norman's wife, Margaret, got a chauffeur to take her to the fields to inform her husband. Um, and apparently, according to their daughter, the conversation went a little bit like this. Margaret said, you've won the Nobel Peace Prize. And Norman replied, no, I haven't. <laughs> uh, and he genuinely thought the whole thing was a hoax and it took a lot of convincing for him to finally realise that he was being given the award, which he then accepted the same year on December 10th. I just, <laughs> I love the idea of travelling 40 miles, get, getting a phone call, if I was Norman's wife, getting a phone call at four in the morning, your husband's won the Nobel Peace Prize, cool, okay, can someone get me a taxi, I need to go out to the valley, 40 miles away to tell him, you drive all the way there, you find him, you're like, Norman, you've won the Peace Prize. And he's like, I haven't. It's just not true. <laughs> I'd be so angry. <laughs> oh, drag him all the way back to Mexico City, put him on the phone to the Norwegian officials and be like, tell him yourself. Um, <laughs> so after this, of course, Norman went on to have a further brilliant career, but I've run out of time today. Um, so I would highly encourage you to go out and have a look at his story if you're interested. But more importantly, and I really want to stress this, if you have any questions, any questions about crossbreeding, plant breeding and the health effects, please ask me. There is so much misinformation on the internet about the effects of plant breeding on human health. None of it's true and I don't want you to be misinformed following this episode. So if you have any questions about crossbreeding, please come and ask me. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Biologist of It and I'm always happy to take questions. I understand that um, domestic breeding can be a scary topic, especially when we're talking about DNA. But trust me, come talk to me. It's fine. I'm happy to talk you through it. The ins and outs of it, everything. We'll get right into it. Norman Borlaug is now often referred to as the father of the Green Revolution and is credited with saving over a billion people worldwide for starvation. Um, there is somewhere that cites exactly how they figured out that number. I will pop that on Twitter and Instagram for you to have a look at. Norman once said, you can't build peace on empty stomachs. 
and I believe that to be so very true. And he had an obvious goal from the beginning. He wanted to save lives. He wanted to increase yield and productivity. And Norman did just that. He also, in 1968, received a really sweet tribute from the people of Cuidad Obregón in Sonora that I spoke about earlier, where he did that research very early on. Um, they named a street after him. And I think that's so sweet. The combination of winning a Nobel Peace Prize, having your work recognised internationally, and then back where it all started, having a street named after you, is such a full circle moment. And it has been an absolute pleasure of mine to introduce you to Norman today, if this is an introduction, and if you're just a big fan and you wanted to listen to his, to his story again, then welcome back. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. I've been B. You have been wonderful. This has been The Biologist of It, and I cannot wait to talk to you and my very special interview guest next week. Make sure you're following or subscribe so you don't miss the episode. And I will see you there. Take care of yourselves. Bye.